All right, we're going to go through these today, and I'm going to um, share some of these. Uh, Thursday, on the 15th, I shared over at Christ Foundations at the Voice of Healing Conference, and we were talking about some of the, uh, what I was trying to share with them is just some of the essence of what we teach in the Divine Healing Technician training. And one of the things after that that God started reminding me, he said, you know, uh, a lot of the people at the church and even people that watch by internet and different things, uh, they don't know some of these things. They may have heard them, but I know for me, I had to really see them uh, over and over and to really get it in me because these are not, this is not a checklist. Please understand it. This is not a checklist, not something you just go down and, you know, for every time you're going to pray for somebody, you go down and go, okay, here's this. I'm not talking about that. We're talking about principles that you have to get in you. And then they, they, you start living them. And so each one of these are, I don't want to say it's just a mindset, but they will change your mindset, right? So I want to share some of these. Now, so we're going to go through the, uh, quickly, through the list of 15 divine healing secrets that John Lake said you needed to function fluently in healing. And so we're going to go over these. The first one is that you must destroy the sacred cows concerning, concerning sickness and power, I should say. So destroy the sacred cows concerning sickness and power. That means you have to go in. Now, um, I've, I've, we've done other lists before, and I'm actually writing some things on this now, and a lot of this stuff is going to be on the website that people can just go in and read. But uh, the sacred cows that we have so far, I have a list of literally 52 sacred cows. Uh, mainly dealing with power and sickness, predominantly. Now, there's a few other things here and there, but mostly, uh, and we will be uh, getting rid of all those. We've already been doing that, but we will be taking those one by one and going through them and explaining them and then putting those out. So the first thing is get rid of that. That has to be out of it. You can't be thinking that sacred cows are true. Uh, for instance, you know, one may be that you have to get all the sin out of your life before God will heal you. Okay, it's a sacred cow, right? Everybody Jesus healed were sinners, Every one of them not only had sin, but according to the Bible, were sin. I mean, they were, just as we are now righteous, before you're born again, you were sin, right? And so it's the same thing. And so all of those people not only did sin or had sin, but they were sin, so, and yet he healed them. So you don't have to get sin out. Now, I'm not saying live with sin in your life. You should get it out. I'm just saying you don't have to wait till that to get healed. God will heal you even if there's sin in your life. Right? which should help put a fire under you to get rid of the sin after you get healed. Right? I know that's kind of how it worked in my life. So, Now, number two, recognize sickness and disease as an enemy. It can't be a tool that God is using to make you a better person. It can't be something that God is trying to teach you something. Now listen, here's another one. Reese Howell wrote a book called The Intercessor. He was a great man of God. He was awesome. One area he was wrong. Okay? A lot of good stuff there. I'm not saying don't read the book. I'm not saying anything negative. But he had the idea that when you entered into intercession, that many times God would let you experience what they're hurting. We know they're, they're hurt, right? And I, now, because he said it that, and that was his understanding, because of that, many times they opened up as in intercession to feel that. And really what he didn't realize is that when you pray for people, Many times those symptoms will try to come on you, but that's not God. That is the enemy retaliating for your prayers, right? And so you have to realize if it's not right for them to have those symptoms, it's not right for you to have them. You're not Jesus in the sense that you vicariously carry other people's sickness or disease. He did that. You don't, right? Our job is simply to be deliverers and set the people free, not bear those burdens, Right Now, there are burdens of people we are to bear, but it's never sickness or disease or anything that is covered in the atonement of Jesus. All right? So, and he had the idea that if you entered into deep intercession, then this, these symptoms, you would feel their symptoms. That is not the will of God. Right? That is a retaliation of the enemy. Now, when you are praying for people and they're right in front of you, many times, for instance, I, I'll give you an example. I've been praying for people as I was praying for them. I would have like a pain maybe in my left knee. Well, when that first happened, then I realized it happened right when I stood in front of this person. And if I stepped over here, it would, it would disappear. And if I stepped back over here, it would come back again. And I realized, oh, okay, this is actually a word of knowledge. 
It's how a word of knowledge operated telling me. And, but, and then I had to learn because uh, the first time I said, okay, do you have pain in your left knee? No. You don't have any pain in your left knee? No. Hmm, okay, well, maybe I'm wrong. Well, I got pain in my right knee. And then I realized my left knee was directly across from their <laughs> right knee. And so it wasn't that I was wrong. I just didn't understand. So I had to learn and grow. And I had to realize that I was, it, it was coming across and I had to switch it around. And I go, okay, so if it's in my left knee, I have to say, is it in your right side or right knee or whatever it is? So it, it's growth. You learn as you do things, all right? And so I had to learn in that. Now, so it's, there are times when it might be a word of knowledge, but the only time I've ever, ever experienced that was whenever I was right in front of them, right? And if you experience that, then you can say, is that what it is? And if it's true, then say, okay, then if God showed me, then obviously he wants you well. So be healed in Jesus. And so you can actually minister along those lines. But normally, if you're experiencing, especially while in intercession or immediately afterwards, uh, for a person, if you experience the symptoms they had, it is retaliation. It is not God. It is not something God's trying to use to give you compassion, right? Jesus had compassion, and there's no record of him ever being sick, right? So don't think you have to experience something to have compassion for people. The love of God is shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost, and that's the compassion. Amen? So, number three. This is the easy one. Get fed up. You just got to get fed up, right? At some point, you got to decide. I'm done with it. I'm done with sickness or disease. It ain't happening to me. It ain't happening to my family. And anywhere I see it, I'm going to crush it. I'm going to destroy it. Why? Because I'm going to be doing what Jesus did, and I'm going to be enforcing his victory over the enemy. And so you have to just get fed up and refuse. You have to put your foot down and go, no more. Now, when you do that, and let me just be honest with you, when you do that, you're probably going to be tested in that area. Now, that test is not coming from God. you got to get that. The enemy will come to see if you're serious or not. Right? So usually whenever you make that decision, and, and everybody knows this is true because people say it all the time, you know, if you say, well, you, you know, I've decided I'm going to live in divine health. Oh, don't say that. You don't want the devil to hear you say that because you know he's going to come. You know, that's exactly who I want to hear it. And let him come, and I will pass the test, and I will beat him, and then he'll know from now on I'm his master, he ain't mine. Amen? And so you have to learn immediately. Get fed up. Put your foot down. Refuse it. Now, you say, well, what if, it, what if I do that and then it, it gets on me? And, you know, I have to go to bed for a day or two because, you know, I'm sick and it came on me. All right? Guess what? Your experience does not dictate the truth of the Word of God. So even if you don't pass that test, get up and take it again. Get up. Make that same statement. Fill yourself with the Word of God. Make sure it's in you, right? Fill yourself up with it. Get serious about it. Go into it. Study it. Uh, just live in it, you know? Play CDs talking about healing. Go through the training. Listen to it. Read it. You know, a, a good way to say it is this. Just become obsessed with healing at least for a short period of time. If you do it for a short period of time, it'll get in you and it'll become part of you and then you'll be able to stand. But the main thing is you don't quit and you don't back off of something just because you don't live up to it the first time you try. Amen? You know, I know people that have quit smoking 25 times. Right? What does that mean? That means they technically never quit until the last time. But they tried. And God bless them for trying. Listen, we, 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 we are too quick to emphasize they failed. And we need to realize they tried. Right? And you try and you try and you get better at it till you beat it. Amen? Our job is to get fed up and to beat these things, not to just, you know, get under condemnation because we didn't do it. Amen? And, and I'm, I, it, that's in everything. That's in uh, temptations of, of sin. It's in temptations of bad habits. It's in everything. But it's also in our deciding that we're going to live according to the Word of God and, and get aggressive in these things, which actually is another one here. So now, look at the next one, number four. Number four is you treat all sickness the same. That means that, because, you know, we, we technically, well, what we do, most humans will categorize sickness as to whether it's, well, you know, that's, that's a 24-hour bug, right? No big deal, just, you know, drink fluids, go to bed, rest, whatever. It'll be over in 24 <laughs> hours. 
uh, and then it gets more serious. Oh, well, this is more of a, you know, this thing's, I've had this three or four times this year. Why does it keep coming back? Well, you go to the doctor and, oh, this is chronic. This is going to keep coming back. And, and we start categorizing. Or, you know, this is cancer. Okay, now, now it just got serious. Why? Just because it can kill you. Well, uh, maybe it's HIV. And so people start categorizing. According, but you have to realize, if you're going to flow in healing, you can't play with any of it. You, you have to decide it's all the enemy, and you treat it all the same. Right? It, now, in warfare, you have to understand, you treat one individual the same way you would treat an entire army. Right? You don't treat them different. Why? Especially now, one individual can have telecommunications and can be communicating to an army. And so an enemy is an enemy. It is to be eliminated. It is that simple. Amen? Sickness and disease is an enemy. It is to be eliminated. Not played with, not toyed with, not, not uh, coddled. Okay? So you treat all sickness the same because if you did not have an immune system, all sickness is the same. It'll all kill you. Right? And so look at it from that viewpoint that it will all do the same. Number five, treat all sickness like a person. Now, what that means is, now we know well, we're supposed to be nice to people. That's not the kind of treating I'm talking about, right? You treat it like a person, meaning you speak to it like a person. You, it's almost like you see it as a person. Why? Because many times, and, and you'll see this as you minister to people that have had uh, situations in their life for a long time. People over a period of time have to learn how to cope with that sickness or disease. And as they learn to cope with it, they start to alter their life. And the more they alter their life, the more that they embrace that sickness. And I don't mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's that they're trying to. I'm saying they have to learn how to get along with it. And so they start to identify with that sickness. And then whenever you mention that sickness to them, you're talking about them. You're not talking about your sickness. Now, I, I've had instances like this where I've talked with people who was going to minister to them, and they had a, a, a deformity that they've had all their life. And so for them, that deformity was them. It was part of them. And if you pointed out that situation, then they would automatically become defensive or even hurt. And so you, I had to learn how to approach people like that because you can't approach them because your mindset may be, okay, this is not you. It's an enemy that's attacked you even from birth maybe. But that's not their mindset. And so you can keep your mindset, but when you talk to them, you have to be able to make sure they understand you're not attacking them. You're attacking that thing. And you don't even have to say it. You know, you don't have to tell them that you're attacking that thing, right? But you have to treat it like a person and talk to the, the, the problem like you would any enemy. And so you begin to speak to it. You command it to do what you want it to do. And it's very simple. You just simply, people say all the time, how do I pray for this? How do I pray for that? Easy. Tell it what you want it to do. If you want it to leave, tell it to go. If you want it to die, tell it to die. If it's a, a germ or a virus, tell it, virus, die, if that's what you want to do. Honestly, I try to follow Jesus' example. He never got specific. Right? The, the most specific he got was when he would say, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, that I might receive my eyesight. He said, receive your eyesight. That's as specific as he ever got. And all he ever did was answer them. He, re he took their question, rephrased it into a command, and said it. Think about that. So the way to pray for anything is simply tell it what you want it to do. Sickness and disease, go. Body, be healed. It's that simple. Speak to the problem. Well, we'll get there in a second. I guess I'm getting ahead of it. So, number six. This is a big one. Command not beg. You're not even talking to God about this. I do not ever talk to God about any person's sickness or disease uh, unless I was going into intercession or something, and that's a whole different situation. But in generally ministering to people, I never talk to God about a sickness or disease or a person's healing. Why? Because Jesus didn't. He never prayed. He commanded. He spoke to the situation. He represented God. He did not go to God and talk about the person. He represented God, and therefore he represented all of God's power, and he released that by giving a command. That's who we are. What we're doing, we're doing in his stead, 
in his name. So we're not there saying, see, most people think when we lay hands on somebody, we're, we're pointing them out to God as if, God, this is the one I want you to heal. So there you go, heal them. And God's going to drop healing up. That's not what happens. Healing flows out of you, not falls from heaven. We have to get that. Healing does not fall from heaven. Healing flows out of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. Amen? It's that simple. Now, so you command, not beg. Number seven, speak to the problem, not to God about the problem, and not to anybody else about the problem, right? A good way to remember that is simply this. You speak to God about, okay, let me, let me get it right. I'm going to go from the opposite direction. You speak to the problem about God. You don't speak to God about the problem. You get that? Now, I'm talking about sickness and disease. Now, if there's situations or things, yeah, I'm not saying you don't pray. I'm just saying when it comes to healing, there's no need to pray. No need to talk about it because God cannot say anything other than what he's already said, which is, by his stripes, you were healed. Done. Right? Our job now, since we know that, our job is to simply go to the people and be God's policeman and evict this problem from their body. That's all we're doing, right? That we're just commanding that thing to go, and we're not talking to God about it, right? We don't have to call headquarters and say, do you want this problem gone? No, headquarters has already given us the manual. It's written down in the law, you know, the law of God, okay, saying, by his stripes you were healed, so our job is it, they're healed. So now our purpose is to simply get that thing off of them so that they can experience the healing that Jesus died to provide. Amen? Real simple. Number eight. See people as oppressed prisoners of war. See people as oppressed prisoners of war. When you do that, you will not start looking into their lives to try to find out how the thing got there. You simply set them free. Now, understand, I have to clarify this. What I mean by that is this. I am not saying that we don't want people not to do things that bring the sickness. We want them to change their life. We, because most, most sickness and disease comes really by sowing and reaping, which allows an opening for the enemy to work in. Right? Uh, that's, that's a real easy way to say it. That's the, the biggest majority. <clears throat> so, but the difference is this. There are entire camps of healing that says, for me to get you healed, I have to go back in, find the sin, find the thing you did, find the open door, you know, all this stuff. Jesus never did that. And so we don't do that. Amen? We are operating in his name, and we're to be able to do the same works and greater, which means that we, we do the same thing he did, and it ought to be easier for us, not harder. But most camps of healing make it harder. Because you have to go in, you have to know what, when, how long, all that kind of stuff. And Jesus didn't do it. All right? Now, so you have to see them as oppressed prisoners of war. You're there to set them free, not to find out how they became prisoners of war. Now, setting, if they have habits and uh, practices in their life that will continually cause sickness and disease to come, then yes, that should be dealt with during discipleship. All right? That is not just to get them free. Now you're going to teach them how to stay free. Oh, okay, you want to stay free from that? Then you need to stop doing this because that's going to let the enemy come back in. Now, I can, I, you can keep getting sick and I can keep getting you healed, but it's much better for you to learn how to shut that door that doesn't allow anything to happen. Amen? And that way you're just walking in divine health. And that comes through discipleship. So, <clears throat> now, number nine, get clean, stay clean. That's for you. Now, that just... Listen, God does not heal people through you because you're perfect or because there's no sin or anything else. God uses you to heal people because he loves people and he'll use you with sin in your life and all kinds of other problems just because he loves them. That does not mean that it's okay to have sin in your life, right? It is much better to live free, live clean, live clean before man and God so that you can stand there and know that the devil, when he comes, has nothing in you. Because if you're going to be ministering healing, you're probably going to be dealing with devils at some point. And if you're going to be dealing with devils, if you're not clean, they will tell on you. Right? And you just don't want that happening. Right? You just want you don't want them saying, Hey, I know what you just did, I know what you did, I know what you did. No, you want to live clean 
so that they can't say anything. And even if they try to lie, you just tell them, shut up, and they'll shut up. Amen? So just live clean, stay clean, you know, get clean, stay clean. It's, it's not that hard, and it's a good life. There's, listen, most of, okay, we could really go into some areas here, and I don't have time to go into too far. As a matter of fact, we might have to break this into two parts because we're getting down here. But um, now, according to Dr. Caroline Leaf, she said in her medical research that she has found that 87% of all sickness and disease uh, is basically due to wrong thinking, essentially. It's, it's the thoughts that you have. And she says the other 13% is essentially has to do with life choices. Food you eat, different things you do, you know, just, just life choices, toxic things, all this kind of stuff. And you can get her book and read about it it's in, in detail. Now, um, you know, I don't know exactly about the percentages, okay, but I do know this. <clears throat> if you take a vehicle, or let's just say a motor, you take any motor that was designed to run at designed to run. I'm not saying the max. I'm saying if it was designed to operate at, say, 5,000 RPM, and yet that thing will do 20,000 RPM, and you kick that thing on, and you run it at 20,000 RPM nonstop, and I mean, you're just constantly, it's on. In a very short period of time, the thing is going to start shaking, it's going to start rattling and things are going to start working loose. Screws are going to come undone and the thing is going to start falling apart. Why? Because it was never, I'm not saying it can't operate at 20,000. It obviously can. But it was never meant to operate at that level constantly. Right? Do you, you agree with the analogy? Right? Now, your mind and your body was, it is capable of doing phenomenal things. I mean, undergoing outrageous stress and pressure for long periods of time, right? It can do that. But your body and your mind were not created to do that. You understand? I'm not saying it can't do it. It can. But it was never meant to operate at that type of pressure all the time. And I don't know where Caroline Leaf would say this falls into this, I guess it would be under the thought process, I guess. But I would dare say that the vast majority of sickness, disease, things like that that go on, have to do with stress more than any other one single cause. That would be the single most prominent cause of sickness and disease. Would be stress, which again, I guess, would fall under thoughts and, you know, because you're thinking that's what stress is, is you don't know how to let go of those things. Now, if you just learn what Peter said, casting all your care upon Jesus, for he cares for you. See, if you do that, stress just goes. Any stress you have are things, they are cares that you have held on to rather than letting go, right? So the key is learning to let things go. Now, that means in every area. It means in business, your career, your job, whatever it is. It means in bills. It means in relationships, all that. You have to realize every day you should start brand new. If his mercies are new every day, then we are to start every day brand new. It says don't, let, don't go to sleep. Don't let the sun go down with, with anger and these things still in you and, and without taking care of these things. So decide. When you wake up in the morning, new day. Start brand new. Amen? Don't carry over the days before. And if you learn to do that and learn to cast these cares on him, then that stress leaves and all of a sudden uh, uh, the vast majority of a lot of your physical ailments will disappear just because of the lack of stress. As you, Okay, the lack of stress is what we normally know as peace. And that's what Jesus came to give us, right? And so it's obvious that the enemy, if, if peace is the overall attitude and, I don't say feeling, I guess that's the best way to say it, that God, that Jesus wants us to walk in, then what would be the opposite that the devil would want? Stress. Amen? Because stress is the opposite of peace. And so, obviously, so it, the key is learning to, to walk in peace and not having that stress going. And if you get rid of that now, and then, of course, you add in all the other stuff, you know, food choices and all the, which is not even food. You know, most, most stuff we eat today is not food. 
right? It's all additives, it's all man-made, it's all, you know, all that stuff. So anyway, it's not even real food. So, you know, how we all keep living, it's called the grace of God, okay? Just, <laughs> you know, because I can tell you hardly anything I eat is actually food, actual real food, okay? So, and if I didn't drink Cokes regularly, it wouldn't burn all that out, and I'd really be in trouble then, but no. <laughs> I know. I told you, okay. <laughs> so, no, no. I, they, people hear me say that sometimes, and I tell people, you know, I have to live in divine, I have to believe in divine health. Uh, and, and I want you to understand, I do not encourage anybody uh, to have gone through the things that I have gone through, either in like, you know, my third daughter being dead and raising her from the dead. Uh, I don't want anybody to go through that. I don't want anybody to go through our first, same thing we went through with our first daughter, of her dying and us burying her. I don't want people to go through that, right? <clears throat> now, in, in saying that, I also want to remind people that there are things, when people say, this is a, a law, right? For instance, when we were coming up, you couldn't just go out and pray for people. That was just unheard of. You had to have all this other stuff, you know, anointing, leading, all that stuff. Well, <clears throat> when people say, oh, God won't heal this person uh, until they get the sin out, or God won't, use you to heal people until you get all the sin out of your life. Well, then my first you know, choice is to say, okay, let's see if that's true. Because when I started, I knew I had sin in my life, and I would pray for people, and God would heal them. So automatically, I knew that wasn't true. So I had to go back to the Bible and say, okay, what is truth? Right? Now, I'm not telling. Listen, God will use you with sin in your life. How do I know? Because he did with me. And now, in saying that, I am not saying, okay, because I proved that by praying for people and God healing them while sin was in my life, I'm not saying, hey, let's keep sinning because God will use us anyway. I'm not saying that. I'm saying I've proven that not true. Now, but now at the same time, after that, that's whenever I really started seeing the goodness and holiness of God and it drew me to holiness and the sin and stuff started leaving my life. Right? Be, so I'm not saying because you can operate there, you should. Remember, just because you can operate at 20,000 RPMs doesn't mean you should. Amen? It'll work for a while, but after a while, things start falling apart. Right? And that's when you see a lot of people, many, many times you'll start to see that because most people, if they, are, if they continue ministering to people and getting results, and yet in their own life, they remain sick or different things going on, many times it is because they are in sin and they hadn't got it. Now, understand, let me clarify, okay? You say, so sin would bring the sick. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is this. Many times, and here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that if our conscience condemns us, then we are not to think that we can receive anything from God. Do you got that? If our conscience condemns us, we are not to think we can receive anything from God. Now, understand though, you say, well then, how are they still getting people healed? Well, because you can believe God that God will heal them. But if your conscience condemns you, then you can't pray in faith that God will heal you because you know that there are things, you come up with reasons why God shouldn't. Right? Now, God's not saying, I won't do it. Notice it said, don't let that man who's double-minded, is what we're talking about, don't let him think that he would receive anything of God. It does not say that God won't give it. It says that he won't receive it. See, God's not going to give you healing. God does not give anybody healing. God has already said by his stripes they were healed. Healing has been done. You got that? So God's not healing. He has healed. Now, so he's already given, but you won't receive if you're double-minded and if your conscience condemns you, then you won't receive what God has already given. So, you know, I, if, I, if I said, listen, uh, I've paid for a meal for you over at this restaurant. And if you thought, well, Curry doesn't really know me. If he really knew me, he wouldn't have bought me that meal. Then you would never go over there and eat, even though I paid for the meal. So basically me paying for the meal would have been in vain because you out of your own conscience, condemn yourself, and you would not partake of something I've already provided. Does that make sense? That's the way God is. He has already given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's done. It's not going to happen. It's already done. All that you're waiting for is for you to decide to believe and release what has already been done. 
almost everything in the New Testament is past tense in the sense of if you read it, it's always in the past tense, right? It is seldom future. Nothing Jesus did in the atonement is future-based. You got that? Everything he did in the atonement is past tense, and we can walk in it now because it's already been given. And as you decide to believe it, you will see it in your life. It is that simple. So, now, I've got to move on quickly here. Uh, number 10, stay out of pride. As you begin to minister to people, people get healed, stay out of pride. Anyone can do what you can do, right? And if anybody can do it, don't get in pride. We've got to, make, we, we've got to move away from this Christian idolatry. <coughs> we've got to make sure that people, um, okay, people put preachers on pedestals and then get mad when they fall. Yeah. And many times, sometimes the preachers want to be on a pedestal, but many times they don't. And on the other hand, we as ministers have to realize when, you, when we get put on a pedestal, we have to climb off the pedestal ourselves, right? It's a lot easier to climb down than it is to get knocked off. Amen? And so we, that is what we have. But as long as we keep putting up, you know, uh, raising up, exalting ministers and talking about their anointing and their gifting and these things, as long as we do that, we're going to have this problem and we're going to see people fall away whenever the minister falls. Right? And as a ministry is put on a pedestal, their head goes above everybody else's and they make a good target. Right? <laughs> so that's, you know, people say, well, you know, why, why do you do that? Because I don't want to be a target. Right? Uh, it's much easier to hide in the crowd. Yeah. Amen? Make the devil look for you. <laughs> okay? So, now, next, um, be aggressive. <laughs> Develop your aggressiveness. Right? Concerning sickness and disease and sin. Be aggressive against sin in your own life. That doesn't mean be judgmental and harsh toward people. It means preach the truth, but you've got to speak the truth in love, right? But for yourself, be aggressive against sin. Be aggressive. Cut those things out. Stop those things. Uh, don't put yourself in a position where certain things are. It's like when we were on the last trip, uh, the guy, the trip, the, 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 the team that went with me, excellent job because we told them from the beginning. If somebody comes up and I have to step aside to talk with somebody, you step aside. Don't, there's nothing private that they're going to tell me that they can't say in front of my team, right? And, I, and we have women come up a lot of times and say, can I talk to you for a minute? Sure can with my team, right? We're going to step, I'm going to step over with the guy. Uh, I told him, I said, well, if I go toward the elevator, you go with me. Why? Because I've had people try to jump on the elevator and ride up with me and different things. And, and, and it's not what you do or what you say, it's what people say you do or say. And I said, so, and if I get on the elevator and somebody else gets on the elevator, you get on the elevator, right? I'm not going to ride up with anybody. Why? Because it's just being smart, right? We have to look at things where problems were in the past and eliminate those opportunities for the devil to cause trouble. If you do that, you don't have to worry about things, right? And you'll, you'll have a long life and a long ministry. And so we want to be around a while. Amen? And so you can do things that are just smart and you don't have to be stupid, Right? And give the opportunity to the devil. Now, um, number 12, be led by God's character and nature. Now, this is pretty simple. God is good. He is love. He is light. He is life. And in him is no darkness at all. So there you go. You move toward light, life, and love. And that way you eliminate darkness. You eliminate uh, hate and fear. And you eliminate uh, sickness and disease. All that. So it's just the opposite. Number 13, uh, accept responsibility for your fellow man. You are your brother's keeper. You do take on for them. You do help them. Whatever they have need of, you meet that need. Whatever in whatever area. Spirit, soul, or body. Uh, number 14, decide to obey the Bible and not some arbitrary feeling. Right? Don't wait to be led. Don't wait to be led. Obey the Bible. Do what the Bible says. Don't wait for some arbitrary feeling. Right? Your feelings can change. One day you feel like being generous, next day you don't. Well, do what the Bible says. And then you don't have to worry about it. You'll be generous all the time. Amen? Now, number 15, know that God is in you, with you, and for you. And if God be for you, who can successfully come against you? Nobody. So know that God is in you, with you, and for you. If he's for you, he's not laughing when you have problems. He's not holding back and causing you to have lack. He is with you, and he wants you to trust him, and he wants you to move into the things that he has for you. Amen? So, uh, amazingly, we made it through all 15, which is really surprising. So, we will um, 
pick up some of these others. As a matter of fact, we'll be talking about spiritual secrets of uh, spiritual power or the secrets of spiritual power, how to walk in power. And um, we'll be discussing these over the next couple of weeks. So uh, we do want to, uh, if you do need ministry, we will minister to you. Uh, when I went to uh, Siphonai the other day, it was great. I got a chance to go to the um, presidential luncheon afterwards and uh, sit and talk with uh, President Lindsay and his wife, Ginger, and some of the other, the uh, pastor of the church there. It was good. We made good connections with him. And uh, uh, Dr. Lindsay was, was very friendly, very open, and we, we had a good, really good conversation. And there were people coming up and needed prayer, and he, he said, yeah, pray, pray for him, pray for him. And so we prayed for several people there uh, during the time, and many people coming up, um, you know, we, we just told him, said, you don't have to do anything, just receive. That's it. Just, just know that we know what we're doing and we can get it done. And so over the last meetings, uh, more and more now, we're seeing literally everybody healed. And so we expect that to continue and to grow. Amen? Getting some great testimonies in, so we're excited. So uh, now we will try to think of anything else I need to do. I think it's it today. Yeah. I guess that's about it. So if you will, let's all stand up and then we'll, we'll just pray. And if you need ministry, we'll be glad to pray for you. Uh, at the end of the service. So, Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is true. We believe your word. And, Father, we thank you right now that you have empowered us with your spirit to set the captives free. Father, we, we bless you. We speak life and blessing to these people. Lord, you said they are blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And, Father, we thank you right now that we say we release those blessings. We, we experience those blessings in their lives. So we say in Jesus' name, be healed, be made whole, be free, be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, I'm going to, in just a moment, run up to the front and uh, greet people and then I will be back here to pray for people if you need me to minister to you. So my team will help you uh, line up here and we'll put it together. So other than that, God bless you and look forward to uh, seeing you again. So God bless you. Amen.